Riga Conference podcast brought to you by Latvian Transatlantic Organization. All right. So, hello everyone and welcome to Latvian Transatlantic Organization's podcast. I'm Eva Kirstein, student at the University of Latvia studying political science and I'm a member of Fiat Latvia. And I'm thrilled to have you join me on this podcast episode with a special guest, Andres Petros. And in this podcast episode, he will share his experiences working and helping people in Ukraine during the war. He will tell us uh, what life is like in Kherson, what happens and how it happens, how people live there during the war and what impact it has on them. So I think uh, we can start uh, with the first question. Can you introduce yourself, uh, Andre, a little bit more and tell us uh, how you came up with the idea of going to the war front in Ukraine? Uh, thank you. Uh, well, my name is Andre. Uh, I'm Russian-speaking Latvian, born in Latvia, in Riga, and now I am part of uh, Yata Latvia as well as I'm just a regular office manager. This is, uh, I have nothing to do with military or I have none experience before that. So the idea of going to person was kind of um, out of nowhere, basically. I was reading out of news and then I decided, well, why not to? I have vacation. But the real reasons for that was basically that I felt kind of weak and useless when the war started. So I wanted to see if it can actually make any difference and bring any help to people if something something happens to Latvia as well. And the other uh, reasons that, as I'm Russian speaking, the bubble I live in is kind of predominated by the Russian propaganda before the war. So everything that's going on in the internet influences me and my friends a lot. And I wanted to see everything with my eyes and see if the things that are told to us are truth or not. And the only way to do it is by actually going there and seeing it for myself. All right. Thank you for your introduction. And uh, what exactly did you do in Ukraine? What were your duties there as a volunteer? Uh, I went to Red Cross, uh, Harrison Branch. I tried to see how the life in Kherson is. When I just arrived in the first day, I had a meeting with uh, the manager, the office manager of Red Cross, and we talked about my special skills and what I can uh, bring to the entire team. And we figured out that I have nothing to offer, unfortunately. But uh, the good thing is that I have camera uh, I know how to film a bit, and my task was to actually s- look my- for myself, see how the city lives and how the Red Cross operates. So I was going on, on tasks with the team of Red Cross. They brought me around the city, around the villages, and I am making some stories about the experience. And my main task is to actually bring the word out in the world. All right. Um, thank you. And I think now we can focus some more on like memories and experiences of life uh, in Ukraine. So uh, what was the first thing you noticed after arriving in Kherson? Can you tell about your feelings, uh, maybe some specific moments you remember? Uh, well, just before arriving in Kherson, I was driving through an area where the battles happened. So I saw a lot of destroyed houses and a lot of destroyed equipment, which gave me chills, let's say. And I had an impression of a ruined city that I will enter soon. But in reality, I uh, drove into Kherson, some blog posts, and it was just a city. Nothing uh, was uh, catching my attention. Except the thing that there were no cars, no people on the street, the traffic lights didn't work at all. And it just seems that the city is a ghost of itself. Um, And I had music in my car, I was driving through the city, and it it felt kind of lonely, but it was safe at the moment. I arrived at the gas station the first hour of uh, my presence in the city. And I saw that, that there are soldiers, Ukrainian soldiers, just regularly drinking coffee 
And I stepped out of the car. I looked at them. I heard uh, what was going on around me. And the first thing that I heard were explosions. And the explosions were kind of distant. I didn't understand where are they actually. Uh, I knew that the, behind Dnipro on the other side, there are Russian positions. I saw a Ukrainian planes flying in that direction and uh, dropping, uh, dropping bombs, but it kind of felt still distant. And I was waiting for uh, Red Cross uh, volunteers to pick me up to go to the office. And uh, yeah, basically no one was around except the soldiers at that moment. And uh, I couldn't understand what is going on in the city before that, because uh, everything you see on the internet is kind of, it, it feels different. I was reading a lot of news about what's going on in the person and you hear shelling there, shelling, shelling that, but it doesn't feel close to you. And when I arrived to the uh, office of Red Cross, the guys, the volunteers took me out for a ride and they showed me how much is actually going on in the city. Um, how big danger is it to be at the moment? And my careless uh, driving across the city was kind of stupid, but it was uh, uh, very refreshing to understand that, uh, well, this was my first hours and I already survived. And, and you went alone or with a team to Herson? I was alone. A couple of my friends wanted to, to, to go with me, but uh, I couldn't take the responsibility for their lives. I didn't, to be honest, I didn't uh, realize how dangerous it is when they went. And uh, just after the experience, I now see that it was, it was a good idea not to take anyone with me. But of course, I had help. Uh, people from Ukraine, my friends, they helped me to organize the trip and they contacted me with the uh, correct people and then they helped me to find this volunteering organization. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is life there like? Like how do people live there? How you live there? Like can you maybe describe a typical day uh, was like for you in Herson? Well, the life there is definitely very, very different for from what we experience here in Europe. Um, first of all, while I was driving with the volunteers in the first day, I saw that everything is closed. 90% of business went out of their uh, doings because there are no people uh, in the city. Uh, at the moment, when I was there, the city was, uh, there were living around 50,000 people. So it was only 16% of what was there before. So businesses are closed, uh, the cinemas, shops, everything is closed, there is nothing going on. Uh, very little amount of people on the streets, basically uh, mainly around the supermarkets. There is one actually that is open, like the one chain of supermarkets that still operates. Um, yeah, and uh, the first thing you have to get used to is the explosions and you have to differentiate them which are going out from the city, which is Ukrainian shooting, and which is the incoming. And the incoming is most, most important because the uh, whole city is in the zero zone. It means that uh, any shell that is launched by Russians will land in, uh, in the city in a matter of a couple of seconds. And there's nowhere to actually hide. This is why the first thing you do is you take out all your earpieces or your earphones you don't listen to any music you just go around and listen to the sound of the air and uh, trying to understand if you should jump on the ground and uh, try to hide somewhere they don't even have the air uh, alarm system working because it makes no sense because there's just a couple of seconds before the uh, shooting and the landing of the projectile and this is what lead people live there Actually, uh, this is how they experience everyday life. And uh, for me, I saw two types of people who are trying to uh, 
uh, protect themselves with every possible way. Uh, for example, they uh, try to wear the helmets and the uh, armor vests everywhere they go. Uh, it could be a regular uh, postman or a uh, Red Cross volunteer. Everybody goes out with the protection as much as they can. They don't go out from the houses if they don't need to because the apartments are the most protected places. Um, even when I asked my hosts to show, to give me a guide around the city, to walk a bit, we walked from one apartment to another, just stay safe as much as possible. But also there are other people who are already used to that. And I personally understand that the life continues and you shouldn't be afraid all the time. But they spend all the time on the street. I saw a couple drinking coffee on the street, uh, just sitting out there like nothing happened. And for me, this was very, very strange because during the... Uh, during my stay in uh, in the city, I saw how many civilian objects were shelled all the time. It was like drug stores, the markets. Uh, it was like you can sit in the car and the shell will uh, just come on top of you, or you go through the park and then some explosion happens right next to you. Uh, if you are in a supermarket, one projectile lands on the parking lot, another one lands in your in the supermarket itself so you're nowhere nowhere is safe and uh it's kind of surprised me how people get used to it unfortunately or fortunately i don't know but uh this is the rea reality that the person uh, lives through right now and how often were the explosions like every day every hour how intense it was oh <laughs> after the Ukrainian army liberated the city in November. There were a couple of weeks of calm period when there were no shellings. Uh, apparently, Russians they uh, went to uh, another side of the river and then they uh, organized their positions. And since then, the shelling began. It barely stops. Uh, almost every day, there are some shootings and some shellings. Uh, it's not like the whole city is bombed, but uh, there could be two or could be five, ten missiles per, per day in different parts of the city. And, uh, for example, on Wednesday, this Wednesday, there was a shelling. 86 shells were launched in the city. 21 person died. 46 were injured. So basically, it happens all the time, in the night, in the daytime. So this is why you have to listen carefully what's going on. And uh, you kind of get used to that. And that's the most dangerous part. You don't pay attention to that. But for me, of course, that wasn't the case. I was uh, nervous all the time. It's for me as a European, it's kind of difficult to get used to new sounds, which can mean something harmful. And um, like it's super dangerous. Did you do like any training for this situation, like the security or to defense yourself, like training in Kherson or in Latvia, or you just went there? I had none of it before. I was just, uh, I thought it was a good idea. It actually was a great experience to be there. I'm super happy that I could go, but uh, I don't think any of experience can save you from what's going on in there. Uh, any tr training would be useful if I would be part of the team of friends. Then I could be useful there and I could do much more than I did. But uh, none of the training is actually helpful to, um, uh, to survive that. Uh, I didn't mention that before, but the Kherson city is located on the right side of the river. So there are no Russian troops. There are no fights going on there. Uh, so it's relatively safe, except the shelling. And all the fights, the direct uh, fights, are going on the other side of the river. Uh, this is why the civilians are still in the city. They are not affected by direct fights between the armies. But uh, yeah, this is why they are not involved into them as well. But the shelling comes, and uh, there is nothing you can do to 
actually protect yourself against it. Only the small pieces of metal can be stopped by the helmet or by the vest. Anything else is just uh, uh, gonna either kill you or make you wounded. So yeah, no way to be safe from that. All right, and uh, how did you know where to go or what to do? Did you have like, I don't know, a plan or scan a schedule? Uh, as I mentioned, I had a friend in Ukraine who helped me out. First of all, I want to, wanted to go to Kramatorsk city. Uh, there were also, uh, it, it, it was very near to Bakhmut and uh, a lot of help would be needed there. But uh, as I had friends in uh, Red Cross, they helped me out to get in there. Um, so my plan was to come, to see, to help. Uh, if I would uh, prepare a bit better, I would probably knew more, but uh, it turned out very well anyway. Uh, so uh, everything that was going on in the city itself was organized by the Red Cross. Uh, we went on the uh, humanitarian aid distributing uh, trips across the villages. We went on the... Uh, we were on the night alert, if something happens, we would go out and uh, help people. And uh, yeah, we just had a couple of uh, nights where we walked around the city and uh, listened to the stories and so on with, with my eyes. But nothing was prepared, nothing was planned. Uh, I just followed the orders of my boss and uh, the Red Cross. All right, and uh, how did the locals treat you, the locals treat the Red Cross or the army? Like, what was their attitude to their own people and the strangers? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I uh, have to be honest, uh, they heard my Latvian Russian accent. So they already knew that I'm not local. And uh, there was no problem with that at all. Like, uh, a lot of people speak Russian in her song, and uh, there is no such thing as a oppression of Russian language. So, yeah, of course, a lot of people choose to speak Ukrainian uh, in spite of the actions of Russians. But uh, I felt no pressure at all at any point in Ukraine. And uh, the good thing is that I can see how locals, they actually treat their volunteers and the army. Uh, we went to a supermarket and I was standing in line with another volunteer. We had the Red Cross uh, emblem on our vests and uh, people in the line were just looking at us, they were smiling at us and they wanted to, they offered us to go through the line first. It was just a small thing, but it was very nice. The same thing happened in the post offices. Actually, we were just going everywhere with our clients for, because we were working for, for the assignments at the moment. It was important. Uh, the same way they treat the soldiers. Uh, even though people say that the shellings are meant uh, to scare people, to make them uh, blame Ukrainian soldiers for being in the city, the Ukrainians are still very, very happy to see them because they know that uh, these are the people who liberated uh, them from the uh, Russian occupation. I heard the stories from Ukrainians, from the volunteers, which I talked to, uh, when the Ukrainian army arrived in the city, they, there were huge uh, celebrations. People went out on the street with uh, the flags and they greeted uh, the soldiers. It was, uh, it was just so nice to see the eyes of the person telling me this, uh, the genuine joy of remembering the moment. Another day we went to villages and we were distributing the um, humanitarian aid and people just brought us coffee, donuts, homemade uh, pastries. It was very, very uh, nice and we could talk to those, those people and they were always grateful. Uh, yeah, this is, it's just a very good feeling that the thing you do is important for people and they are actually appreciating it. 
And uh, I can tell without any doubt that uh, everybody in the army is in the army. Volunteering corporations are very, very relevant in Kherson City. All right, and uh, that was nice, like the, the, how they treat you. But maybe can you tell us what was the hardest part, the most difficult moments in Kherson while well, were you there? Definitely, at least for me, those were shellings. Um, second day at the volunteer office we were preparing to go out uh, to the villages to, do, to distribute the humanitarian aid and we couldn't do that because at some moment we just heard explosions around us uh, we at least i at first didn't understand what's going on so we just decided to wait in the warehouse to see uh, what will happen next but uh, our uh, commander the boss of the office, he told us over the uh, radio that we should uh, run to our office, which was the most protected place in the territory. And during during that, we went from one warehouse to another, like small underground uh, safe place. And then we ran to, to the office in between of shellings. So we had like two minutes, uh, three and a half minutes actually to run from one place to another. And the strange part was you never know what is actually going on. You only hear the explosion. You feel it is somewhere near to you uh, and you understand that it's very, very dangerous, but it still goes somewhere around you. But you can feel that it's very scary by the looks on the people's uh, faces from the from the looks of the people faces yeah uh, we were sitting 30 person in uh, 30 people in uh, the corridor of the office on the floor and they could see how uh, much fear they had in their eyes that was a powerful moment for me and the strangest part was uh, after everything ended why would someone bring a tank it was a tank as we calculated the time between the uh, shelling it was around 33 and 0.5 minutes which means the reloading anyway um, someone would bring out the tank which is very expensive i guess for the russians they would aim at warehouse of the red cross of the uh, red cross volunteers they would aim at the post office warehouse and there was nothing else in the territory and they would land six shots on us it, it just was very strange for me but again after i saw what's going on in the city i just realized they have no aim they do it aimlessly and uh, yeah we didn't work that day after all everybody was shocked about what happened and we just went home but it wasn't the only time the second time it happened with me there late was uh, in a village next to the river uh, only around 100 people lived there before the war so now it's even less maybe 20 30 people so we brought uh, humanitarian aid to them and uh, we had the mortars shelling at us also like a village and uh, red cross volunteers with uh, civilians nothing uh, no military objects no military personnel it was just very very strange for me and uh, then I realized that yeah, everything that they show on the internet is actually true. And, uh, you know, if I had some doubts about what's going on in that area, I, I thought maybe they're just lying. Maybe that's just an overreacting. No, it's not. It's, it's scary. And uh, the scary part is that they are doing that for how much months now? Uh, from November, almost half year, I guess. Yeah, that's that's a lot, and I see no reason for that, to be honest. You just uh, mentioned village and people. So, uh, did you talk to the locals about the war in general? Uh, yes, I did. Yes, I did. And um, how to put it correctly? Uh, of course, nobody likes war, and everybody was uh, 
kind of happy that uh, the Russian army moved away from their territories. Uh, they still understand that the war is not over. They still understand that uh, this is going to continue for some time. But at least for me, it seems that they are ready to uh, go through it uh, for the matter of the victory. And uh, yeah, they told me the stories about the occupation times, about how the soldiers uh, behaved uh, in those occupied territories. Again, it was, as they say in the internet, they, they are, uh, it's strange how in a modern world the army can behave in this way. But uh, the locals, they're also used to what's going on. So uh, the war for them is now just part of the life. And uh, they are willing to fight, they're willing to live that life just to live another day. As um, one of the person told me, if we live until the evening, it's great. If we live until the morning, it's even better. Uh, this is their mindset right now. Yeah. And um, they are like uh, waiting uh, for the end of the war or more like uh, they are ready to fight until the end, till the Ukraine win wins? At the places we went, there were mostly elderly people and uh, those who cannot do anything for themselves. So those wouldn't fight. Uh, I guess, but uh, no, they're actually ready to support their army. They're ready to go through with the army, with the means they have. Uh, the people there told me that they're fighting this war and they're joining the Red Cross organization, which is also subjected to a very difficult task. They're doing that not because of the cover, not because of the uh, Russian or Ukraine. Uh, they're doing that for their freedom. They're doing that because they are free people. And they want to do it uh, no matter what. And they want to protect what they have. Done. And this is why what actually drives them. They know that they will free if they stand, if they if they don't, then uh, everything is over. And uh, did you saw any evidence of the war crimes committed uh, by the Russian army in Kherson? And uh, how widely uh, was it talked about uh, by the locals? Um, the locals are still afraid about what's going to happen when they liberate the left city, or the left bank of the Dnipro, because they say they're going to find a lot of uh, dead bodies in the river. Uh, I couldn't see for myself what actually happened there. I only see the consequences of them. So basically the shelling of the civilian objects uh, without any uh, reasoning. Um, I heard stories about uh, the occupation times. Obviously, I couldn't be there at the time. But uh, yeah, people say uh, a lot of things happened in the, the prisons. For example, uh, some of the volunteers, they were put in prison for having a, I don't remember correctly, it might be an uh, image about Ukraine, or it might be the Telegram channel about the news from the Ukraine. They were put in the prison for that. They were held eight person in a room for four. And uh, every time the guard came into the uh, to the room, they had to yell, uh, Slava Putin, Slava Shaigu, Slava Rasi. And ev if you don't do that, they beat you up. And uh, the people who went to the, who were in the cell that told that the screamings from torches never stopped there. Uh, so, yeah. This happens. Also, the other uh, pair of volunteers, they were on a mission and uh, they were stopped in the blog post. I don't know what exactly happened with their, it was either documents or something like that, that the Russians didn't like, but they were put in an actual pit with mud and uh, they were held there for a couple of uh, days. Yeah. 
this is uh, what they do. And uh, in the villages, well, uh, locals say a lot of things were stolen. People came for the kettle, electric kettle. They didn't know what it is. They took the kettles without the electrical part that heats it up, or they took the internet router thinking that they will bring the internet home. Uh, some uh, interesting things happened there as well. Uh, another thing I heard is that uh, the Russians didn't really obey the laws, the basic laws in, in the city. For example, uh, when they just entered the city, they were going uh, around it on the heavy vehicles and they didn't uh, obey the rules of What's the English word for that? They were driving uh, without any rules and uh, stuff like that. So they were just uh, went over the cars with people inside them with tanks. And this is uh, this is a crime, right? Uh, yeah, it's supposed to be. And uh, yeah, for for this time, it's basically the shellings of the uh, of the territory. That is. Like all these okay. stories are uh, really dangerous and how dangerous it is there for unprepared visitors. Well, as I said, I was just driving aimlessly in the first couple of hours when I came there and I had no idea what's going on. Uh, if I was unlucky, then, mm, then definitely uh, something would happen. Uh, but also during the showing itself, I realized I had no idea what to do. If not the people around me, not the people who experienced it before, everything might have changed uh, differently. Uh, because they know where to go, they know what to do, where to hide, how to react. Uh, they basically, uh, even if they fear, they don't let the fear to control their minds, which is a completely different thing if you're new to this. And... Uh, I wouldn't say that if you have no experience, you can easily go there because that's not true. The more experience you have, the better it is. But again, uh, the amount of experience you can have uh, that will protect you is very little, to be honest. Again, there is no uh, way to protect yourself against the shock. Uh, but the strange thing is uh, when we were in the village and we were uh, hiding from the shells, us volunteers, we just jumped on the ground trying to self, uh, self, uh, save ourselves while the locals, they said, oh my God, you just scared us. Why would you jump so, so bad? And the uh, locals are kind of used to that and they don't even uh, react to it anymore. Yeah. Uh, so I would say that uh, it is dangerous, it is dangerous, but there is nothing you can do about it. Like, there's no real way to save yourself. Um, you were there one week. Uh, that's enough. That that isn't a long time. But is there anything you learn? Because I think this uh, experience is extraordinary. And uh, yeah, maybe what are your insights? Yeah, well, one week wasn't uh, enough to see everything, but it gave me some uh, perspective on what's going on in the city. And first of all, I think that the city uh, that the people who stayed in the city they have already won as personalities because this is a huge uh, th this experience has a huge impact on the personality and a huge impact on how the person thinks and uh, i was there for a week it was already terrifying so to be honest i was sleeping very very well in person because it was too terrifying to be awake i was uh listening to the explosions around me. It was uh, too difficult. But people live there and they do it every day and no matter, no matter what, they continue to help each other. And with that, they uh, still have enough courage to be responsible for their actions and to be responsible for each other. And uh, it definitely unites this experience unites people a lot. The, the Red Cross, they are very, very friend, friendly to each other. They're like a family. And uh, this uh, was the insight 
I like the most, and I took close it to my heart that no matter what, there are people around you who will uh, help you, and that uh, no matter how difficult it is, if you are not alone, then there will be things you can do, and things that you will be useful as well. Um, it takes courage to go there, a big courage. And if someone else uh, would like to do a similar job as you, but uh, is unsure or can't decide what to do and how to do it, uh, what would you say? Uh, from my experience, I can say that uh, don't think too much, just do it. But be ready that you can... In case of Ukraine, you can lose your life. That's for sure. Don't have any uh, other ideas about it. It's dangerous. But don't overthink it. And if you're ready, then just go and help. But to be honest, the best help we can do right now is to spread the word. Because what I saw, the humanitarian, uh, basically the volunteering organizations there, they have enough help from the community, international community. They have enough people. What they need is the world to change as soon as possible, and they need our help with the pushing our governments uh, to provide the help needed to Ukraine. And overall, uh, how do you rate your experience there? Like, are there any highlights or episodes you remember and want to share with us? Well, in general, it was an amazing experience. I'm very, very happy that it could happen. I'm very happy that it, I could actually see it with with my own eyes. And uh, I could say that shelling was the most rememberable thing. Of course, uh, something new, some new experience, but I already told about it. So uh, for me, it was very nice to talk to people there. I stayed at the volunteer's house and uh, we had very long, meaningful conversations about what's going on in the um, Ukraine in general, in Kherson, uh, in particular, with their lives. And what I saw were not very different from each other. We all have the same fears, all have the same uh, wishes and dreams. And just people happen to be in a wrong place and wrong time but they use it to their advantage and they are actually, uh, yeah, they're making the best out of it. This human uh, positivity, I think, it just, it encourages me a lot at least. And uh, would you be ready to go there, uh, back there again if uh, that were a possibility? I think I would, definitely. Uh, but I would like to prepare a bit better so I can actually bring some help. Um, I definitely want to go there if when, they, when the war ends and uh, to see the friends that I've made there. But before that, it would be nice to go, but uh, I need someone to, I would say, sponsor me because I would like to bring something important to the... Uh, uh, the Red Cross office. Yeah. Without that, I, I kind of see no, uh, I don't see me, myself uh, helping out. Mm -hmm. And uh, this all the interview goes to end. Is there anything you want to add or share with us? Um, well, in particular, one thing the war is bad. But the people who are uh, trying to stop it are real heroes. And uh, the thing is, that the heroes are not only the warriors and not only the uh, servicemen. Everyone who is uh, fighting for their own lives, for lives of their neighbors and family, they're already heroes. And uh, this would make uh, the victories happen. And let's be part of it. Let's help each other. Let's help Ukraine. All right. Uh, thank you so much for these answers. And that brings us to the end of this powerful episode uh, where we had the privilege of hearing your experiences in Ukraine during the war. 
And I think uh, your story is a testament uh, to resilience and strength uh, of the human spirit in the face of unimaginable uh, circumstances. And I also uh, want to take a moment to express gratitude uh, to you of sharing these stories with us. Uh, it was really interesting and emotional. And I think it's uh, not easy uh, always to speak about uh, these kind of uh, topics, but it is uh, really important. And uh, yes, I wanted to say uh, thank you so much for listeners. Uh, for joining us on this emotional episode. And thank you, Andre, for uh, being part of this episode and sharing your stories and uh, memories. Thank you, Eva.